So let's begin the next module that is hematology. Um, guys, can you keep your cameras on so that I can see who's here, if you can understand and stuff. Also, I can ask questions that way. Now, so what is this topic about? Hematology. This is about the study of blood and the disorders related to that. So we will be talking a lot about red blood cell disorders, white blood cells, a lot of cancers here, leukemias. Then for red blood cells, we'll be talking about anemias. And then platelets, we'll be talking about clotting disorders. And uh, so these are the three main topics under hematology. Uh, and our first topic will be on uh, sickle cell anemia. Sorry, let me get. Our first topic is going to be sickle cell anemia. And that is a part of red blood cell disorders. I think everyone knows this. Um, we will begin the lecture now. So first of all, in the past, long time ago, people would get malaria. People would get malaria. Let me go okay, here, let's start here. And they would die. Some of, a lot of people would die. There was one type of malaria, what, which is the most dangerous plasmodium species, which causes malaria, which enters blood cells. Someone answer? Pyrex? No, it's falciparum. So plasmodium falciparum would enter into red blood cells. It would divide and it would destroy red blood cells. So through evolution over generations, people started to develop this genetic trait. This was called the sickle cell trait. In this sickle cell trait, what happens is people would get infected, but the risk of severe disease, the risk of death, was very low. So through evolution, people started to uh, be more resistant to malaria infection. That is how this whole sickle cell uh, started. This whole gene mutation, all of it started because of malaria. So let's take a look at what happens here. What is the sickle cell trait? Sickle cell, let's begin the topic. <clears throat> So the topic is sickle cell anemia, and we need to talk about hemoglobin first. Does anyone know what hemoglobin is made out of? Uh, two things. Huh? Uh, two things. What is hemoglobin? Hemoglobin. Yes. And globin. We will talk a lot about heme synthesis, all of that in sideroblastic anemia. That's also my topic. But today our main concern here is about this globin, this protein part. So if we take the normal hemoglobin, I'm gonna start with the fetus stage. Like when we are a fetus, we have hemoglobin as it's called hemoglobin F, HBF, meaning fetus. Okay, and hemoglobin F is made out of four subunits. Here's the alpha subunit. There's two alpha subunits. You write it as alpha two, and two gamma subunits, gamma two. So this is a molecule of hemoglobin. They contain four ion groups where oxygen can come and bind. That part uh, we'll go into uh, more detail later on, especially in citroblastic anemia. So this was the first, this is the first hemoglobin type that we have as a fetus. And these hemoglobin will be present in our blood for about six months after birth.
Now, this is very important because this relates to the treatment. Okay, this hemoglobin F. So after six months of birth, we get different types. So in an adult, sorry, it's about 1% hemoglobin F. And in a patient, I will discuss these words, sickle cell trait, just write this down. They will also have around 1%, while a patient with sickle cell disease can have up to 15%. They can have up to 15% of hemoglobin F. <clears throat> Okay, so in a normal person, as they grow up, this hemoglobin F is going to be replaced by two main types. Wait a second. It's going to be replaced by two main types. One is called hemoglobin A. Let me just draw these first. So there's two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. And this is called hemoglobin A, HbA. And in an adult, it accounts for around 95% of all hemoglobin. Guys, can you see my whole screen, uh, like what I'm drawing? Yes, right, okay, thank you. If there's an issue, let me know. So in an adult, you have around 95% of HbA, which is two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. And there's also another type called HbA2. This is HbA2. This has two alpha subunits and two delta subunits. This is HbA2. Uh, right. Yeah. This is around 5%. You also have a bit of hemoglobin F, one, around 1%. So this is a normal person. Okay, now, which subunit is affected in sickle cell anemia? Can someone tell me? We have alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Beta. Which, uh? beta. Yes, this beta subunits, the gene that produces this beta subunit is affected in sickle cell anemia. Now, don't confuse these names, okay? Sickle cell anemia, I'm talking about sickle cell trait, I'm talking about sickle cell disease. Don't worry, the main topic is sickle cell anemia, and there's two subtypes. One is sickle cell trait, the less serious one, and the main disease is sickle cell disease, okay? If you have any questions, please ask. So, in sickle cell patients, They have abnormal beta globulin chain, globin chains. The alpha chain is normal. So does anyone know the amino acid substitution? Which changes to what? Yes, you are correct. Glutamate. 
if you want, you can write glutamic acid. It's the same thing. Glutamate is just the salt. It's replaced by, uh, you call this a missense mutation. If you plan to do USML, you need to know this word and you need to know this example. It's a fancy word for, it was replaced. Also, if you have yet to study genetics, that word is essential. This is changed to valine. And the problem comes because glutamate was hydrophilic. Valine is hydrophobic, meaning it hates water. So if you don't know what these words are, hydrophobic means hydro water, phobic means hate something. Okay, if you are not sure of these words. Now, this is the amino acid substitution, which occurs, occurs in chromosome 11, codon 6. Yeah, just write it like this. In the sixth position, the glutamate is changed to valine, which is hydrophobic. So now let's take a look at what this sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease is. In sickle cell trait, you get one abnormal copy. So You get one, let's say this is the paternal one, that is abnormal, while the maternal one, this has the normal glutamate in it. That means during transcription and translation, this one produces the abnormal one, don't draw this, this produces the abnormal one, and this produces the normal one. And because this is abnormal, the normal kicks up a notch and produces more. Like that is much more activated than the uh, abnormal gene copy. Okay, I will explain what it means. So this leads to sickle cell trait. This is a less severe disease. Sickle cell trait, meaning you have both HbA. Okay, this is supposed to be red. And you have HbS. So you have the normal hemoglobin, alpha 2 beta 2, and you also have the abnormal type, alpha 2, S2. This is what happens in sickle cell trait. And the reason why I said that this is much more activated is because if you take a blood sample, there will be 55 around 55% of this. You don't need these numbers. I'm just telling you so that you understand better. And around 40% of this. So that means this gene was much more active than the other one.
Now, next, let's talk about sickle cell disease. If you get both bad copies, if both are bad copies, you get sickle cell disease. This is severe. And for this, uh, can someone answer? Do we get normal HBA? If you do electrophoresis, do you get normal HBA? No. No. There's only HPS. You can draw the cell. Just draw one cell and draw HPS. Sickle cell disease. Okay, uh, I have a question. Can this S carry oxygen? The abnormal hemoglobin chain? Yeah. Yes, it can carry oxygen. So where's the problem? Why is this a problem? If it can carry oxygen, why is this a problem? The capacity reduces. Uh, yeah, over time, the capacity reduces. Uh, we'll come to that. But the biggest problem is oxygen is going to be carried. But the moment the cells become deoxygenated, the cells change shape. So let's take a look at that formation of sickle. So it can carry oxygen. That's all fine. It goes to the lung, collects oxygen, and it goes to the organ gives the oxygen, and once it gives the oxygen, there comes the problem. So in a normal red blood cell, okay. let's uh, draw around three hemoglobin molecules around the corners of the cell if possible. This is a normal red blood cell. they will be carrying oxygen. This is a normal red blood cell. Does the shape or the elasticity change after it gives out its oxygen? Uh, I'll give you time to draw. So uh, can someone tell me, does the shape change when normal, ox um, when normal red blood cells gives out its oxygen? No. No, right? It maintains its shape. But a sickle cell, Red blood cell. Let's take a look at a sickle cell. 
it has the normal shape when it's oxygenated. So draw three molecules. And in this case, draw the sickle, uh, the S molecules. <clears throat> so they too will be carrying oxygen. There's no problem in carrying oxygen. What happens is, if this red blood cell, this abnormal HBS red blood cell, the moment it is deoxygenated, or if it enters an area of low hydration, if it is dehydrated, or if it enters an area that is acidic, acidosis, So if you meet any of these criteria, what happens is they will form a sickle shape. The reason for it, I will tell. So I will focus on the deoxygenated part. The moment it gives out its oxygen, the moment the oxygen tension reduces a lot, what happens is these Hemoglobin molecules, they polymerize. They will come together because now they are exposed to the water. When there was oxygen, it was protected, but now it is exposed to water. So what happens is they come and they polymerize. So they come and come together like this. They have moved from their original locations. They have just come and polymerized. This forms a polymerized Sickle shape, inflexible. Red blood cells are very flexible. They can uh, squeeze and go through blood vessels. This is inflexible, or you can say hard. Red blood cell. This is what happens in the formation of the sickle. And this is where the complications arise. There are two complications. One is hemolytic anemia. And the second one is vasoocclusive disorders. Oh, let me just write vasoocclusion of small blood vessels. Passive occlusion of small blood vessels. <coughs> so these are the two complications. Does anyone know what the difference between thalassemia and sickle cell anemia is? Anyone who knows? Like uh, with regards to these two complications, 
uh, which is present in thalassemia? Is it one or two? One. One. Uh, in thalassemia, it, it's hemolytic anemia. There's no vaso occlusion. Okay. If you want, you can write it down. So, hemolytic anemia. I try to break down each and every single word. If I miss anything, if you don't understand a word or any part of this, just ask me, okay, unmute it and ask or send me a message. So, hemolytic anemia. This means destruction of red blood cells. Okay, hemolysis, hemolytic anemia. In this case, we get a normocytic anemia We will talk about uh, macrocytic, microcytic anemia, the breakdown in a uh, later chapter, but just for completion's sake, just know that this is a normocytic anemia. So what happens here is these red blood cells, they undergo repeated cycling. Uh, what I mean here is, when they go through the uh, veins where there's less oxygen, they become sickles. And when they come back into the lungs, they become normal shaped again. So they change shape constantly. Okay. And this leads to repeated cycling causes membrane damage. So which organ in our body removes damaged red blood cells? Spleen. 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 Okay, you have the liver also, but our topic, our main concern is the spleen. Extravascular hemolysis. In spleen. Again, we will go into detail about the spleen in another chapter, but for now, just yeah. I'm going to draw it like this. Uh, I need you to understand there's just one portal, a portal of entry into the spleen, but then to make it easier to understand, I'm drawing it as two. So what happens is they come, these red blood cells come, they enter into the red, red pulp. This is called the red pulp. Uh, we will talk about the, hemato uh, the histology of the spleen in another topic. For now, uh, just know that the red pulp is where all these red blood cells come and collect. So what happens here is in the red pulp, there's a lot of macrophages. Uh, does anyone remember what I called mac macrophages? What do I call macrophages? <clears throat> a word which I use to describe macrophages. And this is basically the trash bin. Okay, this is a garbage collector. It goes whenever it sees something uh, which is damaged or is anything unnecessary, it goes and eats it up. Okay. Macrophages are basically the trash can of our body. So what happens here is extravascular hemolysis. Outside the blood vessels, there's going to be destruction. Outside. Okay. This occurs in the spleen. So there's going to be red blood cell number going down. What happens when the red blood cell count is low? Anemia. Anemia. This leads to anemia. Okay. So anemia, okay. What else will elevate in blood 
when there is a severe destruction of red blood cells, GI module. Exactly. Unconjugated bilirubin. There's going to be jaundice. Unconjugated bilirubin. Uh, let me write it. Unconjugated. We did this in gallbladder, the chapter. And also the risk of gallstones increase. Okay, this was in the GI module. <clears throat> okay, I will give you guys a minute. Just draw. So let's continue. Now we have hemolysis, okay? We have anemia, the red blood cell count goes down. If the anemia is untreated, if the anemia is untreated, <coughs> it leads to two uh, very specific phases I, uh, that you can see in this disease. Let me explain what that means. So if you don't treat the anemia, then the bone marrow, it will expand to replace lost blood vessel, blood cells, lost RBCs. <clears throat> if anemia that occurs is untreated, the bone marrow expands to replace the lost red blood cells. Okay, that means the bone marrow spaces will increase inside the bones. And if it increases in the uh, in the face, that's why it commonly occurs. You get this crew cut appearance. All this is that uh, there is an expansion. All the bones they have expanded to allow more hematopoiesis, to allow more bone marrow spaces. And also because of that expansion, you get this typical appearance called the chipmunk faces. You will hear about it in thalassemia also, but basically if you have an anemia, if you have anemia, which is untreated, I will not go into detail about that sentence. You can get the crew cut appearance. Wait, let me write it. Chipmunk faces and crew cut appearance also because the bone, like the space between the bone, let me draw. If this was the bone, so this outer part, it's the bone, and in the middle, you have the bone marrow because of the expansion of the bone marrow, uh, just watch, don't, you don't need to draw it. You can, I'll give you time to draw it yourself if needed. So this is expanding and the bone thins like this. What is this condition? Last module. Guys? Huh? Osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. Wait, let me turn on my camera again. Yeah. This is, uh, it leads to osteoporosis. Due to 
bone marrow expansion. <coughs> okay. Again, uh, Prashan is doing thalassemia. When he does this, he will talk about the chipmunk faces and the full cut appearance a bit more. Just know that if you don't treat this anemia, the bone marrow expands, the trabecular spaces, it will increase, and uh, you get the classic appearances. Now, This, uh, this patient, this sickle cell anemia patient is highly dependent on the bone marrow. Am I correct? Is that statement correct? The patient is highly dependent on the bone marrow to keep producing blood cells, okay? So in these patients, if a virus called parvovirus B19 comes and infects them, their bone marrow stops producing. Like in the sense that what happens in the virus, it's there's going to be a stop in the production of red blood cells, of all cells. So that leads to something called the aplastic crisis. Let me, I will write it and I'll explain it again. Aplastic crisis, crisis can occur due to parvo virus, P-A-R-V-O virus B19. as these patients are highly dependent on bone marrow for continuous synthesis. Let me explain the statement, the, underlining the word continuous. If you are doing USMLE, this is a typical question. This you need to know. What can cause a plastic crisis? So let me explain this again. These patients, okay, us. If you don't have sickle cell disease or trait, we can live for a while, even if the bone marrow is not functioning. So let's say we get infected with power virus B19. It's an infection of children, actually. Uh, but a normal person, they can live for a while, even if the bone marrow is not functioning properly. But a patient who has... Uh, sickle cell anemia, they are continuously dependent on the bone marrow. They need continuous production. So if power virus B19 comes, they, are, they can go into a plastic crisis. That means the bone marrow is not producing red blood cells, uh, blood cells, okay, all blood cells. So this is it about the hemolytic anemia. Uh, can someone tell me the treatment? The treatment? We will talk about treatment. Uh, just tell me. Blood transfusion. Blood transfusions. Because of the hemolytic anemia, uh, patients who have severe disease, they need blood transfusions. Okay. And this also leads to other problems like iron overload, stuff like that. We'll go into detail. The second one is vaso occlusion of small blood vessels. <coughs> now, this is the, actually the biggest problem in sickle cell anemia. In thalassemia, we don't have this problem. In sickle cell anemia, we have this problem. So if you haven't heard these words, thalassemia, all of these, don't worry. Uh, you'll be learning these. That's occlusion of small blood vessels. 
the main thing you need to know is it can occur anywhere in the body. It can occur in the brain, leading to strokes. It can occur in the heart, heart attacks. It can occur literally anywhere. So let's take a look at what this passive obtrusion actually means. What happens is these sickles, sickled cells, they are not flexible. They, so what have they do is they will go and block a blood vessel. That's simply what vaso occlusion. Vaso means blood vessel. Occlusion means you close it. You cover it with something like this. Okay. So then the blood flow cannot go through. This is what vaso occlusion means. Okay. Let's take a look at the complications. The first one is dactylitis. Can someone tell me another name for this? Uh, I'm gonna write three here, like three things this way, because there's nothing to write or draw for. That. Uh, there's nothing much. What is dactylitis? <laughs> Sausage fingers. Sausage fingers. You can draw a person. Uh, guys, at the end of the lecture, I will be sending this flashcard. Uh, okay. I have put all the important stuff. So I will send it to the groups. Just draw a person's fingers. It's actually a child. Draw a child. Two, three, four, five, six. No. They have swollen fingers. That's what dactylitis is. And uh, here's an image of dactylitis. You can see these swollen fingers. And this, okay, now, is sickle cell anemia a disease that presents late in life or early in life? Early in life. Early. After how many months? After six months. Six months. Exactly. I will uh, tell why. I am in the sense I will write it later. But sickle cell anemia occurs after six months of life. Can someone tell me the reason? HPA. 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 Exactly. Because of this reason, sickle cell anemia symptoms start six months after birth. And the first symptom, the reason why a mother would take the child to the hospital is because of this dactylitis. <clears throat> and then usually uh, they will do blood tests. They will establish the diagnosis. Okay. And then you start treatment. But then uh, there are other symptoms that can occur. Avascular necrosis of the hip. So what is avascular necrosis? Since the blood flow is occluded, there will be a necrosis in the... Exactly. Ava avascular. Loss of the vasculature. A means absent. Vascular blood vessels. Necrosis means death. Uh, this is tissue death plus inflammation. This is for the people uh, who are still to learn these topics. Necrosis is not a normal process, it's a pathological process. Avascular necrosis of the hip. So, okay, I don't, I'm a bad artist, but I'm going to try to draw the hip like this. Draw the bone, the femur, with jagged ed edges like this. It's not smooth. And then you can draw the hip bone. 
and on the other side, draw the normal bone. Draw a smooth femur. This is normal and a vascular necrosis. <clears throat> Uh, if you have learned surgery, you should know corticosteroids, long-term. Uh, just write these down. I will explain how this. Long-term corticosteroids can also cause a vascular necrosis of hip. It's most commonly in the femur, uh, in the sense in the hip, okay? This is a fact you need to know uh, for surgery. So let's take a look at the radiological images. I'll give you time to write. I'll show this and give you time. <coughs> this looks relatively normal. Okay, this is the normal femur. This is an, is it a CT scan or an MRI? Can someone tell me, is this a huh? MRI? MRI. Okay, you can see all the muscle, the, all these details like, properly. And you can see how the femur here looks jagged, not smooth. Yeah, this is the typical finding in a MRI. In a CT scan, in an X-ray, usually this is what you do. I don't know if you can see it properly, but it's not smooth. You can see these edges, okay? That is a typical finding of a vascular necrosis. Is it mostly unilateral? Uh, these images are unilateral, but in sickle cell anemia, it is uh, bilateral, okay? These images are unilateral, but everything in sickle cell anemia is usually, like in a majority of the patients, it's bilateral. I checked. I made sure to check that. Next, we have the hallmark. Now this topic, it comes under pediatrics mostly, but because it can also affect adults, we have to learn it here. So the hallmark is something called pain crisis. Is it, I think it's ES. Whatever it is. Wait. I'm just going to write it as ES. Just check it later. This is the hallmark. So if a case study or if uh, you see a patient who comes with this thing called pain crisis, uh, you should, in your head, think uh, this is sickle cell anemia. So what happens is you get sudden onset of pain uh, anywhere in the body. Okay? It could be in the abdomen, it could be the bones, it could be the hip, leg, just anywhere. Usually these are children. <clears throat> and they will have constant hospital visits. So if you get a patient who has been constantly being hospitalized because of sudden onsets of pain, one thing uh, you need to think of is sickle cell anemia. The treatment for this, because dehydration is a cause of sickling, uh, I had a question, acidosis, I just saw that. Okay. Acidic environment. I will explain that. Uh, so, 
because of the dehydrated environment and the acidotic, uh, because of dehydration, it can cause sickling, it can cause the pain crisis. So the treatment is hydration. That means you give IV fluids plus analgesics. We talked about analgesics in the previous module as uh, NSAIDs depends on the patient's need. <coughs> so in a case study, this is what you will typically get. If you plan to do flab or anything like that, uh, they will describe, we have, we have some cases, they will usually describe this, okay? This is what you need to know as the hallmark. Next, we have splenic failure. So the first three, fourth one, splenic failure. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna draw the spleen again the same way I drew it earlier. Again, there's only one portal of entry, but now you will see why I drew two. This is more like a lymph node. Okay. So the blood comes from here, leaves from here. And obviously this area will be more deoxygenated, the bottom area. <coughs> so occlusion. What is going to happen to the spleen? Build up. This leads to early splenomegaly. In the early stages, you get splenomegaly. And I will just draw a right for this because I need to write something else here. Late, you get fibrosis and atrophy. Because when small blood vessels are blocked, that region doesn't get oxygen. Uh, these are pathology things. That when that region doesn't get oxygen, that place dies, fibrosis occurs, and then there's going to be atrophy. And this leads to something called functional asplenia. These big words, they are, they have very simple meanings. So, okay. Uh, can someone tell me what functional asplenia is? Uh, let me just have. The spleen is there. You haven't removed it from the body. It's on the left upper quadrant. The spleen is there, but it's not functioning. Okay, it's it's become like the appendix, basically. Functional asplenia. That's what you mean by functional asplenia. It's not functioning. It's just there. So the second thing is now. You can see that this part is occluded. There's going to be pooling of blood. Remember, spleen is a reservoir for blood. It stores blood, okay? Pooling of blood occurs. Just like the liver, the veins, this also can pool blood. Uh, don't draw this line. Can someone fill that blank? Hypovolemic. Hypovolemic. Hypovolemic shock. That means low volume. Uh, hypo. Low circulating volume. Why? Because all the blood is in the spleen now. It can't leave, it's stuck in the spleen. <coughs> so usually, this is 
going to affect a child and they present with hypovolemic shock. Okay. And uh, just know this, HB levels fall rapidly. Okay, when you do a blood test, a blood count, you find that the HP levels have fallen rapidly because the blood is not in the circulation. Can someone tell me the main function of the spleen? What is the main function of the spleen? Okay, forget the red pulp. What does the white pulp do? Name says it. Lymphatics. <laughs> the lymphatic drainage. All the body's immunity uh, with the lymph node, the spleen, they involve in the destruction of anything that is unnecessary, especially encapsulated bacteria. So infections with encapsulated bacteria. This simply means bacteria that have a capsule. Okay, if you're not sure. Encapsulated bacteria. <laughs> so there's three things, three organisms you need to know. The first is strep pneumonia and H influenza. Okay. So the treatment is penicillin. Uh, we will talk about treatment again. Prophylaxis. Plus vaccination. <clears throat> so the penicillin prophylaxis is, is usually given till the age of five. After the age of five, only in like severe patients, the doctor will decide to give. But after the age of five, the body develops immunity, right? develops rapidly, uh, can handle these bacteria. So we will talk about that later. And also, what is the most common cause of osteomyelitis? Osteomyelitis. Oh yeah, uh, the word prophylaxis. Uh, give me a sec. Prophylaxis means before the onset of disease. You start treatment before the disease even begins. That's what you mean by prophylaxis. Back to the question. What is the most common cause of osteomyelitis? <clears throat> Staph aureus. Yes, osteomyelitis. From, in this case, what is the organism? Does anyone know? Salmonella, okay? Salmonella. Usually, uh, this is from either surgery or from even the previous module, I mentioned this. Osteomyelitis is usually caused by staph aureus, but in sickle cell anemia, osteomyelitis is caused by salmonella. Uh, 
osteomyelitis is infection of the bone if you're not osteomyelitis means bone infection okay, if you're not sure just you can write that down so in others in our if we don't have sickle cell anemia, the most common cause is staph aureus. <coughs> so that's it about the spleen. Next is renal occlusion of, oh yeah, just like renal occlusion. Now, there's an important point here. Sickle cell disease patients can have all of these. Sickle cell trait patients, they usually only have this. Okay. If you plan to do PLAB, I've seen this question. So what happens here is, uh, I'm going to draw a nephron. <clears throat> this region is called the medulla. And we have the basa recta. Anatomy, histology, topics. And the osmolarity is around 1200 MOS. Yeah. Normally, in a normal person. But when you have an occlusion, uh, can't reabsorb water or maintain medulla concentration gradient. So you can't maintain this, uh, okay? Because you need to move these solids outside to get the water also to come outside. Okay, again, this is uh, renal stuff. You need to move the solids out to take the water also out. But if there's an occlusion, this is lost. Okay, this <clears throat> osmolarity is lost. So what happens if water keeps going through the nephrons? What is the uh, manifestation? Water keeps going. It Poly goes, huh? Polyuria. Exactly, polyuria. Leads to polyuria. That means a large volume of urine passed out per day and nocturia. So, a normal person uh, aged, let's say 20, if they don't have diabetes, it is very rare for them to have nocturia, okay? Like a normal person, it is very rare for them to have nocturia. That means you uh, you wake up in the middle of the night to, because you have to go and pee, okay? So this is renal occlusion. There's another <clears throat> occlusion that occurs that is called papillary necrosis. Renal papillary necrosis. Okay. And let me just tell you, these are the papilla. And uh,
one of the most common causes of renal papillary necrosis is sickle cell anemia. This will die, and this leads to painless. Uh, this statement, just underline and remember this. Painless grow, grows hematuria plus proteinuria. Uh, this is basically the definition of renal papillary necrosis. If you see these words, it's renal papillary necrosis. Okay. <clears throat> now, let's talk about adults. Uh, the, the next two are more common in adults. So the first one is called chest syndrome. Okay. This is the number one cause of death in adults, chest syndrome. Guys, if you have any questions, please ask. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so I was asked the question, why acidosis? Don't write this. Leads to sickling. There is something called the bow shift. The shaped curve you learn in uh, respiratory medicine. So <coughs> when it is acidotic, the red blood cells are more likely to release their oxygen. Okay. When it is acid, uh, when there's a lot of acids around. The red blood cells release their oxygen. And when there's no oxygen in the blood cell, it leads to a sickling. Okay, now that part is going to be important here. Let's take a look at this. So, what happens is if there's an infection, something like pneumonia, so COVID. And it increases the risk we are causing. There's going to be inflammation plus acidosis. Okay. I just explained how acidosis leads to the sickling. And this leads to sickling in lungs. And that leads to vaso occlusion. Okay, so basically, what happens is when a person, an adult, uh, gets an infection and it leads to pneumonia, there's going to be a lot of acids produced. So, with that, all the red blood cells are going to start sickling in the lungs itself. And then you can't carry oxygen, there's no oxygen going into our body. There's going to be chest pain, shortness of breath, all of these, uh, which can lead to death. Okay. <clears throat> and the treatment, you need to give antibiotics, fluid, pain medication, etc. Okay. <coughs> So these are the treatments. And finally, especially for USMLE, they love to ask this. This is a surgical topic, but can someone tell me what priapism means? Pain Yes. Pain Exactly. 
the word painful is very important painful prolonged erection <clears throat> okay so this is what priapism and uh, this is not because the person overdosed on viagra in this case uh, this is because the blood vessels so if this is the penis this is the corpora cavernosum all of these blood vessels drainage is impaired Okay, so this leads to priapism, and uh, this is it for the uh, pathophysiology of sickle cell anemia. Let's quickly go through the diagnosis and the treatment. Yeah, priapism. So I hope everything is clear up to now. Let me go back and check. Again, I need to, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> uh, highlight this fact. Sickle cell trait patients, they will usually only have renal occlusion. They won't have the other things. They will usually present with polyuria and nocuria. Okay. But the others, especially this is very common. Okay, if you have sickle cell disease. Now, the diagnosis. So the main way to diagnose this is electrophoresis. Okay. <coughs> what happens is, I'm gonna draw three slides. And over here, I'm gonna write the types of uh, hemoglobin levels reached. Yeah, HB. Yeah. So what these level these points indicate is, if the person if the person has HbA2, you get a line here. And HbA2, you get it in everyone. In a normal person, in a sickle cell disease, and in sickle cell trait. So we have the three. Can someone tell me, in a normal person, will there be a line for HbS? No. Okay. HBF? Yeah. Yes. It's a small line, but it's there. And then there's going to be a big line because this is around 90%. There's going to be a big line for HBA. Okay. Electrophoresis separates uh, things based on the charge and the size. Okay. So the bigger, the heavier ones, they will move less compared to the smaller ones. So in a sickle cell disease patient, will they have HBS? Yes. Yes, that's the biggest one, okay? They will have around 80 to 90%, like the line will be very thick. What about the HBF line? What do you think is going to happen there? It's there. It's there. Yeah. Is it thicker than the normal person or is it the same size? Same. Actually, in this case, the patient will keep producing HBF. They will have a slightly thicker line. Okay? Uh, up to 15%. Remember, I mentioned it in the beginning. Sickle cell disease, they will have up to 15%, okay? Around two to 15%. And there is a treatment, 
there is a treatment just draw a dotted line and show on hydroxyurea treatment hydroxyurea treatment so there is a treatment called hydroxyurea it's uh, you basically give that to increase the hbf amount so that uh, you have another type you have another type carrying oxygen and will a sickle cell disease patient have hba okay i'll give you time no no okay they don't have hba so if you want uh, when you go with hydroxyurea treatment you can have around 18% hbf <coughs> not 15 now it has increased to around 18 Okay, now tell me, for sickle cell trait, oh, I'll give time, I'll give time. I can see you are writing. Can someone tell me for sickle cell trait, uh, will they have a bigger HBS or a bigger HBA? HBA. HBA. Okay. So when you're drawing it, just make sure that uh, you draw a bigger box for HBA. I told the reason. The reason this DNA is going to be much more promoted acetylated, etc. This will be inhibited, methylated, etc. Okay. When you put a met methyl group to DNA, it shuts down that uh, expression. So, Write these numbers. There will be around 55% here and around 40% here. Just write that for that. Uh, also draw the line for HBF. It's 1%, it's around 1%. Now, uh, let me tell something here. Sickle cell trait is a very common incidence, especially in like uh, India and sub-Saharan countries. Uh, sickle tra cell trait is very common, okay? Because they, uh, there's a lot of malaria. So uh, the second test that we do, electrophoresis is the main test. <clears throat> you can do something called the sickling test. This uses something called sodium metabisulfite. Okay. So this is basically a test tube test. And uh, what happens is, HBS curved. Cur simply put this and cause sickling, and then the solution turns turbid. You can look, uh, use a microscope and look under that, and you can see the sickled cells. Okay, this is not an important test. The 
third one is a blood pitcher. The third test, it's a blood pitcher and that is the most commonly done. Basically, you take blood and you look under a microscope. And if the patient has sickle cells, you see them like this, okay? In exams, you can very easily get this. You need to know what this is. And there's another finding. If the spleen has been, if there's functional asplenia, that means the spleen is not functioning. In the blood picture, you see these Howell Jolly bodies. What do you think these purple things are inside red blood cells? DNA, basically. It's basically nuclear material. DNA and other nuclear material. One function of the spleen is to remove all of these. But if the spleen is not working, uh, you get this. So when you do this, blood picture you can see the spleen status like if it is working or if it is uh, a function uh, non-functional and then give me a second there's the fourth one full blood counts there will be increased reticulocyte count and low hemoglobin. Just write that. Can someone tell me what is a reticulocyte? The precursor of red blood cell precursor. Again, we will go into detail in the next topics, but reticulocyte count, this is uh, this. Guys, we are almost done. Let me do the treatment and give a break. The treatment, I have already discussed everything. So I'm just going to go through the note here. Okay. If a patient has pain crisis, if a child has pain crisis, you need to hydrate the child and you give them painkillers. Okay. And for recurrent episodes, if the child comes with recurrent episodes of pain crisis, you give them hydroxyurea, okay? That's a long-term treatment if they have recurrent crisis, okay? And this increases the HPF levels. And remember this, folic acid supplementation is given to patients who have anemia because it helps red blood cell production, yeah, it helps uh, blood production, okay? And encapsulated organisms, in, uh, if you get uh, infections, to actually prevent them, you need to give them vaccinations and also prophylactic penicillin. So up to age five, you give around 250 milligrams per day. After age five, only if required. After age five, only if required, you give these patients up to 500 milligrams per day. Again, after the age of five, they usually develop immunity. So you don't give it, but if needed, you can give. Okay. And can someone tell me why this is a statement because you will hear this a lot in uh, leukemias. Why is bone marrow transplant curative? It replaces the original the original exactly. Uh, it replaces the future uh, RBC that will be formed will be normal. Exactly. So the factory, the factory that produces red blood cells, is the bone marrow. And if that's where that gene is active, it's not active all over the place. It's active in the places where it has to be active. 
So if this is defective, you remove it, you remove it and put a new factory in. One that works fine. The reason I highlighted this is because when it comes to leukemia, that's why you do bone marrow transplant. Uh, the problem is in these in the factory itself, where it's the gene is active, where the blood cells are produced. So you get rid of it and put a new one. Uh, that's curative. But the problem is there's a lot of debate about what age you do the transplant. Okay. There's no fixed age. At age five, you do this. No, not for this case. And then patients, they might need repeat blood transfusion. There's a risk of iron overload, which is called hemochromatosis. Uh, we will be doing that later. So uh, give me four minutes and then we can take a break, do the cases and finish the class. I have to talk about something small, actually. Uh, just write the topic, other disorders, other related disorders. So, sometimes a patient who has an abnormal gene for HBS can also have an abnormal gene for beta thalassemia. Okay. This is called HBS beta thalassemia. <clears throat> This is the first one. The second one is you can have a normal gene, HBA, and you can also have a HBC gene. So this is called HBC disease. Okay, I will slow down. Uh, just draw this. Uh, glutamate in this case is changed to lysine. Okay. In this case, glutamic acid. So I change glutamate to glutamic acid so that you know. Okay. Yeah, just write either glutamate or glutamic acid. It's up to you. It's the same thing. In this case, you get a lysine, which is more polar than valine. And what happens here is hemoglobin C crystals form inside RBCs get crystals in this case, not sickle cells. <laughs> the third and the final disease is a combination of HBS and HBC. So there's a lysine, and over here on the other side, you have a valine. 